Welcome everyone to today's Edison Electric Institute webinar, a conversation on Saving Us, How to Talk About Climate Change with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. My name is Vanessa Ferrero and I'm a manager for international programs at EEI. Today's session is part of our virtual conversation series where we sit down with global experts and discuss the issues affecting our industry. We are honored to welcome Catherine to EEI to speak about her new book, Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world. Catherine is an atmospheric scientist, professor of public policy and public law at Texas Tech University and the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. She will be joined in conversation by Dr. Lawrence Jones, EEI Vice President for International Programs. Throughout the session, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature. Lawrence will aim to incorporate as many of them as possible into the conversation. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Lawrence to get started. Thank you, Vanessa. Good afternoon, everyone, and good evening or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, we are delighted today to be about to have a conversation about a book by my friend, Catherine Hayhoe. Uh, who is now joining us from Lobeck, Texas. Catherine, welcome. You, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, Here thank you for having me. Well, let's get into the, First of all, congratulations for the book. It has been, a, I know you've been on the speaker circuit and you've been on TV shows talking about this book. Uh, a real success and I've enjoyed reading it. We're going to get right into the book. But before we do that, just tell us something about Catherine Hayhoe that the audience that I don't know, haven't read the book, and the audience may not know, even if they read all the, the nice things we've written about you. Tell us something fun about you that we should know. That's great. I love that question. So uh, I spend so much of my time looking at data and facts and figures about the science of what's happening to our world and how it's affecting every aspect of our lives and how our future choices matter. And all of the work I do is so abstract often and often so depressing. And so when I have time off, I do not read fiction about apocalyptic climate scenarios. I knit. And this painting behind me is actually made out of yarn. People might not know that. I didn't make that myself, but I just love wool and I love yarn. And so that's one of the things I have with me. Well, good to know. Uh, in fact, there's actually one scenario in the book where you, uh, you talk with a gentleman, I guess, uh, at one of those climate conferences who all of a sudden discover that you had something in common, which was knitting. Uh, That's I, right. Yeah, yeah, so uh, good. All right, so let's get into the book. A lot to cover, uh, a fascinating book, multifaceted, covering science, faith, bring it all together. Big topic, climate change. So why did you write the book? The only reason I wrote the book is because I didn't have anything that I could give people that answered the two biggest questions that I was getting every single time I spoke with people. And today I get these questions literally every day. The first question is, what gives you hope? And the second is, how can I talk about this to a family member, a colleague, a neighbor, someone I work with or know? How do I have a conversation about this when it just seems like either we're arguing about it or it's so depressing, I just wanna go back to bed and pull the covers back over my head. So that's why I wrote the book to answer those two questions. Interesting. So you, you start the book off by, by talking about the six Americas based on some work done by another uh, famous author like yourself. And you don't like the idea of uh, sort of an either or climate deniers, climate believers. Tell us why that's not a good construct. And who are these six faces, uh, the six faces of America, I guess, in terms of climate, but in terms of other issues we're dealing with? Yes, so often when it comes to climate change, we think of people as falling into two categories, us or them. And we do the same over any contentious issue. Climate change is one of the most contentious issues in the United States. Often with climate change, we even label those two groups, believers or deniers. And I don't like either of those names. I don't like the word believers because a thermometer doesn't give you a different answer based on what you believe to be true. Climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious, those are facts. And we can say, I believe or I don't believe the facts, but just like with gravity, you could say, I don't believe in gravity, you step off the cliff, you're going down. 
I don't like the word deniers either though, because it's applied all too often to people who have questions about climate change. And frankly, you know, listening to the way climate change is discussed in the media today, who wouldn't have questions? You could be listening to one person saying it's a hoax, another person saying, sure, it's real, but it's no big deal. And somebody else saying it's the end of the world. How do we know what to believe? So in my book, I talk about the six Americas of global warming, which is a really helpful framework that was put together by the Yale program on climate communication. And I don't know if I can actually, oh, I can't share my screen with you because I was just going to show you a little illustration of it. So let me just describe what that looks like. It's six groups of people. And at one end, we have alarmed and concerned, and they make up 55% of the whole country. In fact, oh, there we go. I can share now. I just like to show, show the actual image so you can see it. There we go. Uh, so you see alarmed and concerned are pretty big. And when you factor in cautious, you're at three quarters of the country. So three quarters of people in the United States are alarmed, concerned, or cautious about climate change. About 70, I think it's 78% of people in the UK are worried about climate change. Those numbers are higher if you speak to young people or if you go to Australia or if you go to France, I think it's 86% of people are, are already worried. So whatever country we're in, most of us are already worried. But over there at the far end, there's the dismissives, the eight percenters who are absolutely convinced this is a hoax. And even though in the United States, there's quite a few of them, there are some in Canada where I'm from, there are some in Australia, there are some in the UK, there are even some in France and other countries. But we often overestimate those dismissives. We think that there's more of them than there really is because they're so loud. Mm. And they're so often in the media. But the reality is they're a very small group of people. And you know what? We can have constructive conversations with everybody else about why it matters and what we can do to fix it. And often the biggest barrier to those conversations is the fact that we are really worried and we don't know what to do about this. That's the biggest barrier we have. So, so you say in the book, Catherine, that one of the ways to solve climate change is to talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, and you spend a lot of time in the book. What I find amazing is the amount of examples and people you've talked to. How was it? I mean, you, you, you talk to people from the entire spectrum, the religious spectrum, political spectrum, academic spectrum. What was it like for you engaging with people from so many different walks of life? I have talked to all kinds of people about climate change. And in my book, I have all of those stories. And I have stories about other people too. I have stories about a young woman who's a ski racer who talks to other winter athletes about climate change. I have a story about a medical technician who talks to people in his, in his medical facility about divesting their pension funds from fossil fuels. I myself have had conversations with all kinds of people, but here's my rule of thumb. I'm only going to have a conversation about climate change if I can figure out something that we have in common. It could be we both live in the same place or we're both parents. We both have a shared faith. We both enjoy doing a certain activity like playing tennis or running or knitting or fishing or hunting. Um, it might be that we, we have visited a certain place or the fact that we work in a certain industry together. If we can begin the conversation with something we agree on, then connect the dots to how climate change is affecting us and then bring in positive constructive solutions that we can engage in as a university as a business, as a nonprofit, as a neighborhood, as a city, as a church, as a family. Something that we can do because action is the antidote to despair. So in essence, start by finding common ground, finding mm -hmm. that common issue, whatever the issue may be. Um, and so let's get to the other topic that you spend a lot of time dealing with, which is facts. You spend mm -hmm. a lot of time working on facts and data. Uh, but you, in the book, you talk about why facts matter, but facts are not enough. And that seems to be the premise of a lot of the conversations you've had with people around the world. So tell us about why facts matter, but why facts are not enough. Yes. So I am a scientist. And so of course I think facts matter. I know they matter because they explain how the universe works. The laws of physics are the same on planet earth here as they are on the opposite side of the universe. It is absolutely amazing. The, the simplicity of some of the concepts that describe how our entire universe functions. Yet at the same time, the complexity of our human minds and culture and experience and how we interact and relate to facts 
is often baffling because, you know, from a scientific perspective, we would say, all right, we've known since the 1800s that digging up and burning coal back then, and of course, oil and gas as well today, produces heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. We've known how much the planet would warm since the 1890s. We've known that those risks were so serious for humans that scientists formally warned a US president in 1965, that was Lyndon B. Johnson, about the risks of climate change. And yet here we are in 2021, about to go to Glasgow in just a few weeks, all the countries in the world are going to Glasgow for the Conference of Parties meeting. Mm -hmm. And we know that countries don't have enough to bring. In fact, in the United States right now, they're struggling to get consensus over bills that would determine whether or not the United States can bring its contribution to Paris or not. And there's a serious risk that it might not. Mm -hmm. So what got in the way there? If the facts are so clear, if we know that humans are responsible, we've checked every other natural cause, we know the impacts are serious, we've confirmed agriculture, water, energy, electricity, all of those different sectors, plus infrastructure, health, and more, we know that the time to act is now. So why aren't we acting? Hmm. It has to do with how we interact with information. Hmm. If we, what we do is we don't look at all the facts and then make up our mind second. What we do is we make up our mind about an issue based on what people we know think. And then we go out and we look for the facts to justify why we're right. Mm. And with climate change, it didn't used to be politically polarized. Back in the 1990s, Democrats and Republicans thought the same thing about it, same numbers. Today, it is the top most politically polarized issue in the country. It's right up there with COVID and racial justice. Climate change, COVID, and racial justice are the most polarized issues in the country. How did it get that way? It was no accident. It was made that way. Because two-thirds of our carbon emissions that are contributing to this extra blanket being wrapped around our planet, two-thirds of our carbon emissions come from 90 corporations. Two-thirds from 90 corporations since the dawn of the industrial era. And many of those companies are the richest companies in the world, and many of them made a decision that it was cheaper to invest in sowing doubt and muddying the waters to delay action than it was to change their business model. And so here we are, where you wake up in the morning and you go to the social media feeds of people you agree with, you go to the news channels of commentators you agree with, you listen to politicians and thought leaders that you agree with on other issues. And if you fall on the political side of this, or the, the right, right hand side of the political spectrum, you will hear people you trust who share your values telling you that climate change is not real or it's not serious or it's too expensive to fix. And the reality is not whether we can afford to fix it. The question is, how can we not? Because it's civilization itself that's at risk. Yeah, and you know, so as you were talking, we had a question come that mm -hmm. came in and it's good for the audience to start sending questions. It's a question from Stephen. Uh, we sort of ties into this. He says, uh, how do you get the population to trust you and your facts, right? So he even he even framed the question as your facts as opposed to facts, right? So 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 Stephen obviously is going to read the book, but I think if you answer that, how do you frame it? Uh, how do you how do you sort of get the population to trust you? In the book, you have a lot of examples where you actually met people with this with these extreme perspectives as it relates to the facts. How do you convince them? How do you get them to, to sort of a, to, to, to change their minds? I mean, you have a lot of interesting examples about people who just didn't believe anything to begin with. And then after a year or so, their minds have changed. So talk a little bit about the process of talking about it in a way that leads to some positive change. Absolutely. And Stephen, you, abs you just asked the perfect question for this. How do we get people to accept facts, to trust them? First of all, we have to recognize that the problem is not lack of education, and it is definitely not lack of intelligence. All too often we assume if somebody doesn't agree with us that they're not educated or they don't know enough information or they might not be very smart. That is not true. In fact, all of us are cognitive misers to some degree. All of us take somebody else's opinion on certain issues that we don't have the time to dig into, right? Mm -hmm. So where do we start? We start by recognizing the two real problems. I don't think it matters to me and I don't wanna fix it. 
Those are the two real problems. We see it as being an issue for future generations or for people who live far away. And we see the solutions as being negative, punitive, harmful, involving loss rather than gain. So how do we change people's minds? Begin the conversation with something that you have in common and connect the dots to how climate change is affecting something you already care about today. Not the polar bears or the Antarctic sea ice, but something that you care about, for example, the economy, national security, personal liberties, as well as, of course, our children and the place where we live and the safety of our home. We conducted an experiment a couple of months ago that was too late to make it into the book. Unfortunately, maybe the second edition. Um, but this experiment was so interesting. We tried this out in real life on social media. So we tried to start with values that were near and dear to the hearts of those who tend to fall on the right-hand side of the political spectrum and wanted to offer solutions that are consistent and compatible with those same values. So I was one of four experts who participated. We made short one minute videos talking about why climate change mattered from our own perspective and what real solutions look like. We had a two time Republican Congressman from South Carolina, Bob Inglis, talking about free market solutions to climate change. We had a retired Air Force general talking about climate impacts as a national security concern. We had the head of a libertarian think tank talking about how climate change infringes on our personal liberties and personal rights. And then I talked about it not only as a scientist, but as a person of faith, talking about how as a Christian, if we take the Bible seriously, we would be out at the front of the line demanding climate action, both because it affects every living thing on this planet, as well as because it affects the poorest and most vulnerable among us. So we did these one minute videos and then researchers at Yale University took the videos and put them on social media in a couple of key districts. They just paid to have them appear in people's feeds, but they didn't track who saw them. They just put them up there and let people watch them. And then they tracked people's opinions in those di districts on climate change. And you know what? They changed significantly mm -hmm. among Republicans. People who identified as Republican changed their minds on climate change when they were exposed to short little videos on social media that started where they were at and explained how climate change is an issue of national security and personal liberties, how climate change can be solved with free market solutions. It's amazing, it really works in real life and it's called New Climate Voices. And I will put the link in the chat so people can actually check out the little videos if they're interested. And I'll, and I'll put a link to the study as well because the study is very interesting too. So, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. So, mm -hmm. so the world is about to go to Glasgow and we'll, we'll come back. I wanna talk a little bit about the notion of uh, you know, uh, the, the, the distancing, the psychological distancing and some of the factors that affect our ability to find common ground or to agree on, on the facts. But I wanna just jump straight to Glasgow where the world is headed in two weeks. And I'm gonna give you a scenario and, and, and I'd like you to respond to it or, you know, play along, go along with it. So let's assume you're in a meeting uh, uh, two weeks from now and around the table, uh, you have Joe Biden, uh, you have Boris Johnson, you have the new prime minister of Japan, you have the new chancellor of Germany, you have the president of South Africa, you have the, uh, you have the president of, 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 uh, of Australia, the prime minister of Australia, you name it, you have every big country and small country around the table, but they're like 25 in the room, world leaders. And they say, okay, Dr. Hayho, tell us, what should we do to, to make a dent in this challenge we're trying to solve? what would you tell them concretely that they should do? Your advice to those world leaders. Each country needs to reduce their emissions proportional to their responsibility. And they know what those numbers are. So the way I think about COP is, that's what we call it, Conference of Parties COP. The way we think about COP is like a potluck dinner. The world has committed to putting enough food on the table to keep global warming below at least two degrees Celsius and one and a half if possible. And so the world has to bring that food. There's not one country that brings the food. Every single country has to bring a dish proportional to how much they've contributed to the problem. Fair, right? And so low income countries, the 3.5 billion people in the world who've contributed to 7% of emissions, they have very little responsibility to bring, but everybody has something to bring. 
the big countries like the US that have contributed 30% of cumulative carbon emissions over the history of this of the last 200 years, they have big dishes to bring, right? So once, once every year, all the countries come together, they bring their dish. And the US comes up with a big apple pie. It looks great, fresh baked, very American. You cut into it and right now it's full of hot air. Another country might come with a tiny little chicken nugget they pulled from the back of the freezer. Obviously they didn't even try. Another country might come with a full, you know, beautiful salad with dressing and fresh vegetables and hand-shaved cheese. Obviously they're actually bringing their contribution. They might be bringing a little bit extra sometimes. There are some countries that are doing that. The Gambia and Bhutan and Nepal and Costa Rica are right up there at the top leading by example. Every country needs to bring its proportional, um, independent, it's called their, their, their um, nationally determined contribution. They yeah. need to bring their own to the table. So instead of pointing fingers at everybody else, bring your own. When yeah. you have brought what you need to bring, then you can point fingers at other people. And right now, again, the Gambia, Costa Rica, Nepal, and Bhutan are the only ones who have earned the right to point fingers at other countries. Every yeah. country needs to show up with their dish. And, and I like that because in the book, you talk about the potluck. Right. You talk about the potluck. I love that analogy of, of how we try to address it. By the way, I, I did not. I forgot one word leader in the room. Uh, Xi Jinping of China. Uh, he is also at the table. So if you want to modify your your suggestions to, to include the, the Chinese as well. That would be great. But let's let's continue on this whole path. There's a question that came in from Roger mm -hmm. and, and Roger is basically asking, you said, you know, different solutions to be brought to the table. There's a, a role for free markets as well. And the question from Roger is, why do you think free market solution to climate change does not get more traction in the U.S.? Uh, and then he says, especially given his prior success with reducing socks and NOx. That's a great question, Roger. So there are two main free market solutions to pollution. Um, they are cap and trade, which has been used very successfully to reduce um, air pollution that, that Roger's referring to. And then there's the concept of putting a price on carbon where you put a price on it because it is costing us. But what's happening is those who reap the benefits of fossil fuels are not those who pay the price. So it's profoundly unfair, not to mention infringing on people's personal liberties. Whatever part of the political spectrum you fall on, there is no reason for somebody else to be paying the cost for the richest multinationals' profits. So the idea of putting a price on carbon has been championed by almost every economist in the world, including the two who won the Nobel Prize two years ago. The country of Canada has a price on carbon, and there's a price on carbon in many other countries around the world. And it is something that is being considered right now. And Senator Sheldon Whitehouse in the United States is a huge champion for the idea of putting a price on carbon. Citizens Climate Lobby is a bipartisan lobbying organization with hundreds of members around, thousands of members around the country who patiently lobby their elected officials. Democrat and Republican to put a price on carbon. And in the House and the Senate in the United States, there is actually a climate solutions caucus that is made up of Democrats and Republicans. You're only allowed to join if you join with someone from the other party and they support pricing carbon too. So it is a mystery to me, Roger, why it is not more popular when it is a free market approach that still allows people to make whatever choice they want while accurately pricing something that is actively harming us that we can put numbers on today. Yeah. My only guess is, and this is just a guess, it's not, an, it's not a, a scientific finding. There, there's something called the Climate Leadership Council that supports a price on carbon. It has many large corporations who are members of the Climate Leadership Council, including many oil and gas companies like ExxonMobil. But just earlier this summer, there was a sting operation where they got an ExxonMobil lobbyist on camera talking about how it was all a joke how they were only part of that sort of, you know, as, as greenwashing, how really they didn't want politicians to do anything. And they were working behind the scenes to make sure there was never going to be a price on carbon or any climate action. So the Climate Leadership Council kicked them out. But I think that that sort of exemplifies the fact that even large corporations that give lip service to the idea might be working actively behind the scenes because they don't want any climate action that might possibly affect their quarterly returns, even if that happens at the expense of all the rest of us who are bearing the brunt of the impacts. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I see the analogy that you just said, I mean, you brought up in regards to the potluck. I wanna go back to the potluck because mm -hmm. one of the things, Catherine, that concerns me, and you talk about it in the book, is that the view of climate change as a zero sum game, 
right? But in fact, it could be made a win-win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and talk a little bit about this issue around everyone needing energy and the, the need for energy in, say, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. And, and how, how do they get their energy in a way that is sustainable, but also in a way that is fair? Right, so you are you were hint, you hinted to this notion of you know the big the one who brings the biggest pie or who's you know eating more of the carbon asset if you may or the carbon budget consuming more of it should sort of bear the brunt as opposed to the poorer countries. How does this get dealt with in Glasgow? Because the poorer countries in Africa, other parts of the world are going to certainly say, look, we didn't do this. Why should we bear the brunt? Mm -hmm. How do we make this a win-win-win for everybody? Mm -hmm. a, is it doable? How, how do we go about getting this win-win-win for everybody? That question also relates to what Michaela said in the chat about um, the ethics and the morality of climate action. Mm -hmm. Climate change is profoundly unfair. In fact, that's why I became a climate scientist is because I always thought of climate change as an environmental issue that affected sort of the environment, but not people. And when I realized through a class that I took to you know, complete my breadth requirements to finish my degree in astrophysics. So I was planning to study astrophysics. And in fact, I already was. When I took this class just, just to complete my breadth requirements, and that's where I learned that climate change disproportionately, well, first of all, not only is it not only an environmental issue, it's a human issue, but it disproportionately affects people who live below the poverty line. It disproportionately affects people who are already hungry who don't have a safe place to live, who don't have access to basic health care, who don't have access to basic education. Um, it disproportionately affects women and children more than men, especially in low-income countries. It disproportionately affects indigenous peoples who have already lost so much. Right here in the United States, when disaster strikes, it disproportionately affects the marginalized communities, which in the United States are primarily black and brown communities. It is profoundly unfair, and that is why we cannot only discuss it as a technological issue or an economic issue, it must be discussed as a justice issue too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. yes. Well, so, so let, me, let me introduce that, and then I would like to hear what you have to say too, because this is your own field as well. <laughs> so electricity mm -hmm. is essential to people's well-being. It's not just energy. It's specifically electricity that has the greatest correlation to people's well-being. There are about 700 million people in the world who do not have access to affordable electricity. They might have kerosene to light their lamps, but they're not on a power grid. They don't have any way of getting electricity. And that is one of the main things they need to lift themselves out of poverty. Energy is a necessity. But today in 2021, fossil fuels are rapidly, not, are rapidly becoming a non-necessity. Why is that? Well, we've been using coal since the Middle Ages. We've been using fossil fuels for electricity since the 1900s, but even back then, even back then, they were building electric cars and they were building hydropower projects and they were looking at ways to get clean energy over a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. But the fossil fuel industry was already being used in many ways and it's, it's very convenient. You can carry a lot of energy with you in terms of your cars, your airplanes, or for transportation. It's not as easy to electrify those areas. And so fossil fuels really took over. But here's the thing. When you look at the distribution of fossil fuel reserves around the world, where are they? They are primarily located in high income countries or regions. So there's the Middle East, where a small number of people have made a lot of money off fossil fuels. There's North America, there's Europe, Western Europe, China also has a lot of coal, but most of the low-income countries in the world with just a few exceptions, just a few exceptions, most low-income countries don't have fossil fuels. So when China is going and building coal-fired power plants in low-income countries, which is what it is doing right now, China has said that it is going to be stopping that practice, but when it does that, it's not a humanitarian effort because where are those countries gonna buy the coal from? They're gonna buy the coal from the countries that have the coal. So when we say, oh, you have to develop the same way we did 200 years ago, we're not only being very colonialistic and patronizing and saying you have to do what we did back then, but we're also saying, guess where you're gonna sign up to buy all those fossil fuels from, us. Whereas those low-income countries have a lot of sun, they have a lot of wind, some have geothermal, some have tides. There are different ways to get energy. And you know what, and you probably know this, right? Last year, according to the International Energy Agency, 
90% of new energy installed around the world was clean energy. So the world is changing. The question is just, is it changing fast enough? So Lawrence, if you don't mind, tell me more. What about low-income countries? What is the most effective way for them to transition in, into, um, into energy, clean energy, and affordable electricity for all? So, so I must say, uh, oftentimes when I interview authors, they don't come to ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's okay because it's a conversation. It's not an interview. So, so I appreciate the question. Look, mm -hmm. I'll just say two things quickly. So first of all, I've said it before and I repeat it. To electrify any nation in the world, it has to industrialize. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you industrialize? Sub-Saharan Africa, I know many countries there. Myself, I grew up in West Africa in Liberia. I've traveled through, throughout Africa, giving advice to governments and, and others about their electricity system. I think the challenge is changing the mindset. Today, many people see electrifying Africa from a only residential customer perspective. When we do know that to really bring down the price of electricity, to make it affordable, you need to have a diverse pool of consumers and you need to have some industry to back it up. And the challenge is, how do you industrialize Africa? And industrialization doesn't have to mean industrialization the way it was done in the US or in other parts of the OECD region. It can be done differently. Africa has vast amounts of resources. And so I think the first thing to do is ask yourself the question, even if you were to use, say, the raw materials in Africa, the timber, the, the, you know, some of the, the mining, whatever you're going to do there, why not create value on the continent? Because if you industrialize Africa, if you start to create value in Africa, the African governments will then have the economies to be able to invest in clean energy technology. Mm -hmm. I must say one thing, even though there's vast amounts of solar in Africa, it is still intermittent. So mm -hmm. no matter how you go about it, you will still need some degree of diversification to balance the intermittency of renewables. Mm -hmm. The reason, the question is how you do it. Uh, currently, there is discussion about using, say, natural gas. There is a role of natural gas. The question is, how do you then, uh, do you do it for the next 100 years? Do you do it for the next 200 years? I think no matter what we do, you're going to need diversity of supply. You're going to need diversity to balance the generation mix when you start having volatility in your wind and your solar. So for, I think sub-Saharan Africa, what I think should be very, very, we should be careful with Catherine is not to use off-grid solutions. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're gonna electrify Africa using off-grid solution because it's only gonna serve a small handful of people living in the rural communities. In the large urban communities in Lagos, Nigeria, in, in, uh, in Johannesburg, in Mom, uh, Mombasa, Kenya, you have millions of people there. So you're not gonna need, you're not gonna do it just with off-grid. You need a balance off-grid, on-grid solutions. But I think the key to electrifying Africa and electrifying the world mm -hmm. is to industrialize the world in a much smarter way. You need mm -hmm. to globalize the supply chain. Don't make everything in one part of the world. Make some of the things in Africa, make some in America, make some in, in Asia, make some in Europe, and let trade be truly equitable. And mm -hmm. when you said race, you, you talk about justice. I think we need to have justice in terms of trade so that goods produced in Africa can be sold in America. Goods produced in America can be sold in China. And do, we, we can't have a one nation, one region providing resources to the entire world. So I'll stop there and then I'll, I'll get back to asking you more questions. So we have a lot of questions coming in. The <laughs> uh, so, so let's talk, uh, we have another 20 minutes here, Catherine. Let's, let's talk a little bit about this issue around uh, psychological distancing. And why is it so important to understand it, not just from a climate perspective, but even from other challenges we're facing as the world goes to Glasgow, how is important? How important is it? Psychological distance is a term for viewing the way we view risks as being distant. And we all do this. So we see, we don't save enough for retirement. We don't eat what we should. We don't exercise when we should. We don't stand up every 30 minutes like we're supposed to and walk around. We don't do the things that we know we're supposed to do. And then along comes an issue like climate change when it's big, it's complex, the solutions might not be obvious or affordable. And it's easier for us to push that issue off and say, we'll worry about it in the future than it is to deal with it today. So psychological distance comes in four different flavors. And when it comes to climate change, climate change hits every single one of those four. 
We can see risks as being distant in time, affecting us in the future, but not now. We can see risks as being distant in space, affecting people over there, but not here. And that relates directly to some of the comments in the chat to do with climate impacts. So climate impacts fall disproportionately on lower income countries because they are less resilient and less prepared. The infrastructure is less resilient if it exists. The farming systems are less resilient. There's no crop insurance. There's no underground irrigation. Uh, so we already see the impacts falling more on the low income countries. And so as a result, people in higher income countries have psychological distance in space. They see the impacts as happening over there and not here. So part of the, of the Paris Agreement and part of the Glasgow meeting that I'm going to, it's not just who brings the dishes to the table in terms of carbon emission reductions. There's a whole other half to this we haven't even talked about, which is the Green Climate Fund. Mm -hmm. And right. that is the rich companies that have produced, or com I keep saying companies, but co it okay. is companies too, but it's countries. The rich countries that have produced all the emissions agreed to put money into the Green Climate Fund to fund adaptation and mitigation in low-income countries. Do you think they've put enough in? No, they have not. So that's the other half to what people are gonna be talking about in, in Glasgow. And part of the reason is the psychological distance. The countries who emit um, all the carbon see it as being distant in time and distant in space. They all, we also see climate change as being distant in terms of relevance. It matters to people who care about polar bears and trees or people who live in low income countries, but not me if I live here in Chicago or London. And of course, it does matter to someone in Chicago or London or Sydney or Toronto. And then we also finally see it as abstract rather than concrete. Global average temperature, scenarios, 2050, net zero goals, as opposed to it snowed and here's a snowball in my hand right now. It's really difficult for us to get past these psychological barriers. How do we do it? We start by talking about what's happening here and now in ways that are concrete and relevant to what we care about. Then people understand, oh, it's actually here. It's actually now. It's real. I can actually point my fingers at something and say, wow, climate change made that devastating heat wave across Western North America this past summer. It made that heat wave more than 150 times more likely. Climate change made the German floods this summer seven times more likely. Climate change is fueling the drought in Madagascar right now. When we make it concrete here and now, we understand that it's not a question of can we afford to fix climate change. Again, it's a question of how can we not afford to fix it? And, and when you talk about, you know, uh, you mentioned net zero and mm -hmm. the theme of this conversation is how to talk about climate change. Mm -hmm. These concepts we're using, Catherine, net zero, decarbonization, carbon pricing, cap and trade. What does that mean for the average person? So, so how do you talk about these things in language that the layman understands, that the voters will understand, that the constituencies will understand? Uh, you know, instead of net zero, what else should people be talking about? Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Absolutely. Well, that's part of what I try to do in my book is I try to unpack some of these concepts because once we understand them in plain English, they're not that complicated, but people throw around these acronyms and these, <laughs> these, you know, buzzwords. And the simple fact is carbon taxes, you put a price on carbon. If you produce carbon, you pay for it in the price that you, that, that you pay for a gallon of gas. Net zero is simply the fact that if we produce carbon as a country or a company, because companies are setting net zero targets, a lot of them, if we produce carbon, we have to take out the equivalent amount of carbon. How do you take carbon out? Nature-based solutions, restoring coastal wetlands, restoring ecosystems, planting trees, conserving ecosystems. I was just at a webinar on blue carbon this morning, coastal blue carbon, where you can um, kelp and seaweed and coastal mangroves. They all protect us from storm surges. They filter the water, they provide habitat. Oh, and they also take up carbon too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really interesting solutions to taking up carbon that we need as part of a net zero goal to get there quicker. Yeah. It's a lot easier to get there quicker if you can still produce some carbon, but take it up. 
Interesting. You mentioned you mentioned the you know these uh, nature based solutions. In, in two weeks, I'm going to be having another conversation uh, with two biomimicrists uh, on the subject of nature based solutions. So, uh, to the audience, if you want to hear more about that, and I assume Catherine is going to be listening in as well, uh, mm-hmm. because I think you're onto something. It's very important to, to think about what nature can help us. Uh, so now let's get more personal. Mm-hmm. How can I make a difference? So there, there's a question here uh, mm-hmm. about uh, from, I think from Laura, a lot of questions mm-hmm. coming in. So I need to go back to what Laura's question was about. For those inclined to view climate change as an existential threat, it also seems that some, many, do not act because they believe their small actions are too small to make a difference. How can we counter that sense of resignation or personal insignificance in the face of such a significant problem. And I think Laura may have read your book because section five of your book deals with that very question. So let's talk a little about what can I do? What can the listener do besides talking about climate change? What else can people do to make a difference? Yes, and, and I know Chris asked a question similar to that above. So there is this false argument that I hear all the time, especially on social media. Do we need systematic solutions? or do we need individual solutions? And my answer to that is yes. Why? Because a system is made up of people. How are you going to change a system without people? We need people to change a system. A system doesn't just change all by itself like a piece of artificial intelligence. But at the same time, and here's where Laura and Chris's question come from. So often we say, okay, climate change is an existential crisis that threatens civilization as we know it. It's civilization. The reason why I called the book, oh yeah, I have it right here. The reason why I called the book Saving Us is because the planet will orbit the sun long after we're gone. It is about us. We are the ones most at risk, us and many of the other living things that share the planet with us. So we're told it's an existential crisis. And then we say, what should I do? And the answer is, well, change your light bulbs. Don't use plastic straws, eat less meat and get solar panels if you can afford them. And we instinctively know that that is not going to fix an existential crisis. So then people say, oh, so you're saying don't do those things. No, I do those things myself. Why do I do them? I don't do them because I think my personal carbon emission reductions will save the world. They won't. They will not make a difference. They're not even a drop in the bucket. It's a molecule in the bucket, not even a molecule. So why do I do them? I do them, first of all, because they're the right thing to do. I don't wanna just talk the talk, I wanna walk the walk too. But I do them even more importantly because I know that action can be contagious. And when I talk about solutions, I talk about what governments are doing. I talk about what corporations are doing. I talk about what churches are doing and nonprofits are doing. I talk about really awesome nature-based solutions and technological solutions. But I also talk about what my state is doing. I talk about what I'm doing in my personal life. And I talk in my book about how solar panels are literally contagious. The number one predictor of whether somebody has them on their house is if somebody else has them within a mile of you. Action changes us. But what the the most effective thing any of us can do is to use our voice. And let me be very specific. I'm not talking about using our voice to tell people how bad it is or to you know, unload a bunch of dire, scary facts. I'm talking about using our voice to talk about why it matters here, now, in concrete ways that are relevant and what we can do to fix it. Do you, are you part of a company? Talk about what you as a company could do. Are you part of a city? Talk about what you as a city could do, a school, a university, a church, a a group of people who go birding or kayaking together or fishing together or people who knit. (laughs) Yes. And, and, And it's true because Catherine, you also talk about in the book, how sometimes these conversations can also change people's lives. I mean, in the book, you give several examples, and I really recommend this to the audience because you will see action in terms of how talking does make a difference. And I think that's an important point. It's, it, people may think of it as it doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter when you see hearts changing, minds changing, and people react in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want to just, we have a couple of 10 more minutes left, but I want to I wanna just zero in on the thing in the book where you talk about bonding, connecting, and inspiring. Mm-hmm. How do we do that? Uh, how, give a few examples on how we can go about uh, forming the bonds that are necessary to accelerate the conversations that will bring about the catalytic change for dealing with the global climate change. How do mm-hmm. we do that? Bond, inspire, and, and uh, connect. 
the first step in bonding is to get to know whoever or whatever it is that you're speaking with, people, organizations. So Lawrence and I, we had a chat before this. We didn't just go into this cold. I feel like I know you a little bit, you know me a little bit. And yeah. obviously you read the book too. So find out what makes people tick and what their priorities are. Because I don't think that climate change needs to be on anybody's priority list at all. Hmm. Let me be clear, I'm a climate scientist. I don't think climate change needs to be on anybody's priority list. I'm not about trying to move it up the list. I'm about identifying what is at the top of your personal list, what is at the top of your company's list, what is at the top of your city's list, or whatever group you're part of, your family, your social organization, school, anything. What's at the top of their list? Nine times out of 10. In fact, I would go even further. I'm going to go to 99 times out of 100. 99 times out of 100. There is a direct way that climate impacts or climate solutions feed right into your top priorities. It could be saving money, it could be efficiency, it could be corporate reputation, it could be your health, it could be your kids, the safety of the place you live, your personal budget, it could be caring about justice, it could be trying to live out your faith, it could be your concern over national security or the economy or the, a place that you love. Whatever it is you care about, climate change affects it and climate solutions can benefit it. So begin the conversation with something you share with someone. And if you don't know what that is, you should be asking them questions and learning about them rather than talking to them. I'm often asked, well, how do I tell my neighbor they need to stop flying? Or how do I tell my, you know, my sister-in-law to stop eating meat? And my answer is you don't. <laughs> because if we begin the conversation by judging, Yes. by guilting, by condemning people, that is not going to change people's minds. It is just gonna turn people off. We wanna show people that who they already are is the perfect person to care. And that because of who they are, they can use their voice, they can talk about climate impacts and they can talk about climate solutions wherever they are. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and I love, this is my favorite part of the book. Sometimes people can talk about them if they're not even on board with climate change. I have a story in my book about John's dad and his solar panels. I had a similar experience with a woman right here where I live. She wasn't too sure about climate change, but she liked to save money and be energy independent. So she was looking at solar panels for the nonprofit that she worked for, not because she was on board with climate change, but just because it seemed like a good deal. That's totally fine. I didn't have to make her agree with the whole IPCC report before she put solar panels on the, uh, on the nonprofit, put those solar panels on first, and then that changes you that changes your perspective. And then all of a sudden you're on board with the science and you're telling all these other people why it matters and what they can do to fix it. So, so Catherine, I, my clock is telling me we have five minutes. I'm gonna steal a few more minutes from your time. Hopefully you wouldn't mind spending. So we'll probably go over by a few minutes, not more than five minutes, but two questions I wanna put into one. The question from Roger again, uh, do you have a view on schools and churches as key channels to social change? But uh, let me expand the question to the book. How has the book been received in different demographics, across different demographics? And are you doing anything to kind of create a version of the book for, say, lay people or maybe for students? <laughs> oh, Lawrence, you wound me. You wound me. Um, it is very much written for lay people. It is not a scientific textbook in any way, shape or form. In fact, I have proof. I have some people who have sent me photographs of their nine year old children reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't want to write um, a, a version that that's um, any more easier to read because I tried really hard to make it easy to read. I made sure I got lots of people to read it ahead of time and said, did you understand this? Did you understand that? Try to make it a bit easier. So how do we use it for educational purposes? I mean, yes. maybe when I said lay person, I didn't mean like, like make it even simpler, but I mean, how can it be used to sort of uh, help other people start the movement to create this contagion of talking about climate change? That's what I meant. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. I didn't want anybody scared off from reading the book <laughs> feeling like they had to have a degree in science or anything. You do not at all have to have any degree. Well, you don't. Yes. Well, so, so what I would love to do, and actually I have some colleagues who are already sort of testing it out, using it in classes this semester. I've been thinking about what to do and I would welcome suggestions because I'm thinking, first of all, there, in this book, there's a lot of references. And so I'm thinking about making a curated reading list of other books that sort of dig into the different topics more deeply because there's many topics in here, all the way from psychology and communication and messaging to clean energy technology. Uh, so a curated reading list of journal articles and some other books, discussion questions, 
I'm gonna make discussion questions to go with each section. I'm thinking about making a short video lecture to go with each section. People could use them in a book club or you could use them in a class. Um, who knows, might even make some PowerPoints to go with it. So I'm definitely thinking about how I could make this into an educational resource that people could really plug into their classroom without making too much extra work for themselves, but that would help the students to really get into this. I think, you know, right now it's, like I said, it's only being used in a few classes because it just came out in September. So that's a bit late for the semester, but I know that it's being used in a Christian theology class. It's being used in an earth science class. It's being used in a sustainability class. And I think it's being used in an engineering and an architecture class as well. So it, it covers the, the, the list. Oh, I love those comments. Thank you. Okay. So curated reading list and discussion questions. I think I'm, I think I am going to do that. I'm going to put it on my website and make it available. Definitely. Well, well, I can tell you, so so it's going to be read by and used by executives in the electricity sector, because I'm definitely going to be uh, having yes. conversations with executives around the world about this topic. In fact, as you know, the electricity sector is already doing a lot. I think the challenge mm -hmm. we have as a sector is that we haven't been doing what you're doing is we're always not good at telling the story. And so I mm -hmm. think one of the lessons from reading the book is maybe we should think about how we tell the story of electricity in a way that people will sort of uh, gravitate to. So to wrap things up, uh, there are two questions here I wanna, I wanna throw at you, uh, uh, Catherine. The first one, you met a lot of people in writing this book, but there's one person you met that intrigued me, Stephen Hawkins, right? Tell me about meeting Stephen Hawkins. How was it quickly? I just wanna just tell us how it was meeting him and, and, and what did you learn from that experience? Well, it's so interesting because I had the opportunity to attend one of his last talks. And of course, in his final days, he spoke very powerfully about the urgency of climate action and the severe risks it poses for civilization as we know it. So I was sitting there actually in the front row, nodding along, going, yes, yes, yes. When all of a sudden he said something that just made my jaw drop. He said, and climate change might get so bad that we will have to terraform Mars and move to Mars. I thought to myself, what? There is no chance that we will be able to terraform an entire planet and move anyone there except for maybe Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and their few friends. There is no chance of that if we just allow climate change to continue unchecked. Because what is at risk again is civilization as we know it. It's not the planet that will be destroyed. It is our civilization that will not be able to cope with the conditions that are more extreme than anything we have seen during human civilization. The planet has been warmer before, the planet has been cooler before, but not while we were around. Hmm. It's our civilization that is at risk and we have no hope of ever terraforming or moving a substantial number of people to another planet if hmm. we don't fix what's wrong with our own too. Hmm. So the next day I was giving my own presentation at this science conference and I was backstage with another astronomer, Martin Rees. Martin Rees is the Royal Astronomer of England and he is also very famous, not quite as famous as Stephen Hawking, but my undergraduate degree, of course, is in astrophysics. So I knew Reese and I'd read all his papers. And so while they were labeling our computers, we both had Mac Airs. And so they're putting different colored tape on them to make sure we didn't confuse them and give each other's presentations. Mm -hmm. Although I would have been very honored to give his presentation. <laughs> um, I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And he said, oh, no, go ahead. So I said, do you agree with Stephen Hawking that we might have to terraform Mars to escape from climate change? And he said, oh no, Stephen and I are old friends, but he doesn't understand that fixing climate change is a dawdle in the park <laughs> compared to terraforming Mars. <laughs> I was like, oh, mic drop. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's interesting that, that these, these, these uh, intellectual giants are all realizing that something has to happen, something needs to happen, and something is happening. Let's end on a positive note. Now that we haven't been positive already, but I want to end on this note, which is the last chapter in the book. You talk about finding hope and courage. And we're going to Glasgow. We're living in difficult times. In fact, I would give you a suggestion for another book. This book is about climate. You could take the same concept and apply it to other contentious issues in society where we can learn to talk with one another, to find common ground, to move us forward and deal with issues from supply chain to all the other issues we're dealing with today. So let's talk lastly about finding hope and courage. How do we do that as we go to Glasgow to come back and tell the world we've done something substantial? What would you wanna see coming out of Glasgow in a context that will give you hope and courage for the next generation in terms of fixing the problem of climate change? 
as I talk about in the book, and this is how I end the book, hope does not begin from a positive place, from a place where everything is going fine and a positive outcome is guaranteed. Hope begins by recognizing it's bad and it could get worse, but there is a small chance of a better future. And what determines whether, whether that happens or not are actions. Hope does not come first with action following. It's action that comes first. It's courage that's required to act. And then hope comes when we act, when we use our voices to talk about why it matters and what we can do, when we get together with people at the place where we work, the place where we live, the place where we love, wherever we are, get together with others, use your voice, advocate for change. It's the only thing that has ever changed the world before. When individual people, not prime ministers and presidents and CEOs, when individual ordinary people decided the world could and should and must be different. And so they used their voices to share that vision with everyone they knew. And that is how the world changed. So I want to end actually with the two quotes. Every chapter has two quotes at the beginning. And I want to end, if you don't mind, with the two quotes that end the last chapter in the book, because I think they answer your question. Catherine Wilkinson, who's a colleague of mine who has a wonderful TED talk about how educating women and girls is a climate solution. She says, it is a magnificent thing to be alive at a moment that matters so much. Hmm. We are living in a moment that will be written in the history books. If there are books in the future and whether there are or not depends on us. Our actions determine that future. And then there's a quote that's attributed to St. Augustine. And it says this, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Mm. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. Mm. Well, no, that's no other appropriate way to end this conversation than on those two quotes. Catherine, it's been a, it's been a pleasure having you uh, for this conversation. It's also been a pleasure getting to know you through reading the book, but also talking to you. We've identified you and I that we have some things in common. So when you do head to, to Washington, D.C., let's get together. And uh, again, I'm going to have my kids uh, reading this book and they will definitely have questions for you when they see you. So uh, thanks again for joining us and uh, good luck on the book and hope to have good, good luck also in Glasgow. I won't be there because I'm going on the other side of the world, but I'll see you when you get back. Thank so you thank so you. much. Such thank a pleasure. You. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and hope you've had a good time. Let me turn it back over to Vanessa, who will give you some last minute words. Take care, Catherine. See you soon. Thank you so much, Catherine, for joining us today and sharing these insights with us. And thank you to everyone for asking so many thoughtful questions throughout the session. We will be sending out a recording to all attendees, which we will also be sharing on our YouTube channel, where you can find recordings from other past virtual conversations and webinars. To continue engaging with EEI International Programs, please follow us on Twitter or visit our website. We also encourage you to register for our upcoming Destination 2050 Dialogues, our COP26 webinar series that will begin on October 25th. You can find the links in the chat. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day.